Everybody, put your hands together, scream and shout and make it loud for Naughty A Mouse. There has been a war going on for your mind. And to give you some sense of the battle lines, y'all still living your lives on the Roman calendar's time. From the days in your week to the months in your year, you still reenact Roman rhythms like they were written up here. You still count and divide all your sunrises by sevens, because that's how many bodies in the sky the ancients with the naked eye could see up in the heavens. And you still pay heed to Rome's gods when you speak the names of every single one of the days in that seven sunrise week. From the Sunday to the moon day, all the way to that of Saturn. Y'all still praising Rome's gods and calling out the imperial pattern. Now y'all Anglo-Saxons might like to poo-poo and be like, mm-mm, that's not quite what I do, but back when Rome first fucked you, they decided that your war god, Mars, was basically the same as their god, Tu. So they said that you could keep him along with a few of the others, too. Specifically, the ones y'all call Freya, Woden, and Thor, as long as y'all good little Saxons never start asking what the pattern is for. See, a calendar facilitates coordination. It simplifies human organization. Using the sun and the stars to count dates aided long-distance trade among ancient states, enabling economic exchange on previously unimaginable scales. Because now motherfuckers knew when to travel hundreds of miles round trip for the slave sales. Now, sure, there are many reasons for people, for peoples, to keep track of time. And for almost every human culture, using the moon and the seasons have worked out just fine. But in order to streamline the imperial habit, in order to make the extraction of surplus more systematic, in order to facilitize, facilitate the collection of debts and taxes, that's why Rome's calendar became standard practice. They say that Rome is dead and its language is past, but I think it lives on like a virus in your head. See, Rome used to use the rising of a new moon to announce the deadline for debts that were due. Now, see now how this continues to apply to you. How much of your life is still spent so that when the new moon, the new moon, the new month rises, be it that of Julius or Augustus, you've got enough to make rent? You can't act like Rome doesn't guide your actions when we still count out our life in Latin like Septa, Octa, Nana, Deca, I got to work and get that chatter so I can pay my social betters. And it feels so natural, like the weather, like it's rooted in your mental architecture, stamped there so you can't question it. This is the rhythm Rome wants you to dance so you ain't got the time to do anything better. This is a system to ensure their position is secure. It's a rhythm where you pay up and stay poor. But I want y'all to aim higher. There has been a war going on for your mind. And this is shots fucking fired. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Please make some noise for Cove Cafe. I am really excited to be here tonight. Thank you. Please make some noise for Linda and the judges who have been doing a wonderful job all night. Now, I used to be a teacher. And I like to think I'm still a teacher, but I used to have a classroom with seats and like bathroom policies. And now I just get to hang around and tell stories. And what I want to do is I want to give you guys a quick lesson in ideology rooted in etymology. Sounds real boring snooze time, but it goes like this. Cattle, chattel, capital. I want you to say it until it rattles, till the sounds bounce around your skull and turn to babble. So perhaps the devil thinks snaps and you have to actually grapple with the meaning of each word. From the slave to the herd, from the sentient suited turd, like cattle, chattel, capital. 
Words for the ideology of jackals. Men who put the color of law on the winners of ancient battles, who made people into property right alongside of the animals. Like, yeah, once this was your land, but now this is my land, so give thanks that you were alive and get down to kiss my hand and try to understand that you are all now just a part of my business plan. The cows, calves, and bulls are useful for their milk and their meat, and as beasts to pull the plow that sows the crops we eat, but you all slaves are here to make the picture complete. Y'all will work the fields. Y'all will make my meals. Y'all will make cloths so soft that I'll never let you feel. Y'all will make the wheels for my wagon and my cart. Fuck around and your family will watch while my dogs eat your heart. Because if you want something right, fuck doing it yourself. Land, cattle, and chattel are the most basic forms of wealth. And capital, hmm, capital's a funny thing. See, it's money that makes money. Given time and water and days that are sunny or the technology kept locked away in a mammal's tummy because Mother Nature might be a bitch, but our father gave you sticks to beat her with. And seed capital doesn't just work with the earth. If you've got a cow and a bull, then you've got the tools to make more cattle. And if your chattel is female, then every male slave owner has got the tools to make more chattel. So try to visualize what Thomas Jefferson meant bragging in the letters that he sent about a 4% return on his investment. I'm sure that his pen is filled with Southern charm when he writes that a woman who brings a child every two years is worth more than the best man on the farm. And try to keep in your thoughts that when you treat kids like crops, you don't realize your profits until you push off the product. And now you know why a slave might scream about a visit from the store, because they know that the baby's going to fetch a fine price in New York. New York, New York, the place that was built on the magic that can happen when you start swapping Africans on the streets of lower Manhattan. Just check out the terms of the banking trade. They ain't changed since the days the, the stock walked the block in chains and climbed the auction block to learn the new owner's names, all of them branded, before they ever landed at the docks with fire and hot metal. And you need to be unsettled. You are just lucky that you have never smelled the burnt flesh or heard the screaming, but you need to know the origins of the logos that you wear up on your chest. Back in the days when brand was still a verb, you could not ignore the meaning of the words cattle, chattel, capital. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Now, quick uh, question here. How many of you guys have ever heard that Coca-Cola used to contain cocaine? Quick show of hands. True. It might sound like an urban myth, but it is straight fact. Now, here's the thing. How many of you guys knew that cocaine in Coca-Cola was actually the original recipe? All right, pretty much everyone, my ass, I thought, that Coca-Cola might have tried cocaine, like putting raisins in oatmeal cookies, like a twist on the original recipe? No, that's not the way it works. See, Coca-Cola is coca leaves and cola nuts, and sugar and water and some other stuff. Now, coca leaves, well, they contain cocaine, same way that coffee beans contain caffeine. So unless you take the time to take the cocaine out of the coca leaves, any drink mixing coca leaves and cola nuts is going to have cocaine in it. And I don't know how many of you guys know this, but the guy who made Coca-Cola, he was a smack fiend. Coca-Cola was his second draft. The first thing he did was make the Victorian version era of Four Loco. He put cocaine in wine, called it Wine Coca, having a great time selling it. But this was the late 1880s. And in the late 1880s, the Irish and the Italians, like, not white yet. And they were starting to move into the country in large numbers especially in the deep south, in the dry counties that you can still see today. And this, well, that's where Coca-Cola comes from. So they didn't want to have a drink that might be sold to like non-white kind of Irish and Italian people because they were drinking a lot. These counties went dry, couldn't sell wine anymore. And so our little smack fiend had to figure out a new thing to sell and what he was cooking up in his garage. Took cola nuts, took coca leaves, sold cola coca. He was not good at advertising. 
he ended up selling the recipe to a guy named Asa Candler. And there's no test. These names don't matter. But if you look up Asa Candler, you will find out he would end up becoming the mayor of Atlanta. He was the only man in the country legally authorized to import coca leaves. Because coca leaves contain cocaine. Why did they take it out of the leaves? They already had it in there. And that's a whole separate story. See, in the early 1900s, well, there was a rumor going around. And the rumor was this. Cocaine was going to make black people bulletproof. Unstoppable. So you had to get the cocaine out of everything. And if you've ever heard the song Saturday Night Special by Leonard Skinner, it's about the fad of selling sheriff's departments new sharecropper stopping bullets. You can look up the advertisements. And for a company based in Atlanta, you want to get ahead of this little scare. So they take the cocaine out. But here's the kicker. Do you think they threw the cocaine away? No. They start selling it. And they don't want to sell it retail because then that's going to give them a bad image. They go wholesale. Coca-Cola goes to the hospitals because cocaine, like Novocaine or Provocaine, will numb your face. And it's key to surgery. And now remember, there's only a little bit of cocaine in every leaf. And so the companies that are trying to make cocaine are, sell, are throwing away 99.5% of the leaf. Coca-Cola is using their whole brain, and they are using 100% of the leaf. For them, cocaine is trash. So to this day, there is one company worldwide that runs the entire global cocaine market, Coca-Cola. And if you trace back along the lines, you can see in Atlanta, mayors, run on cocaine, long before we ever decided cocaine was going to be illegal. And I think the reason is this. No matter what side of the law you're on, it's all about money and power. And cocaine is just one of the many fine white powders. Thank you. Yeah. One poem or two? Do I got time for two? Uh, okay, 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 okay. Can I tell you guys one other fun fact that I realized that connects into this poem? Yes. Tobacco is a drug, right? Yeah. So, okay, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, drug dealers. These are people selling tobacco. They had massive tobacco plantations. And some people might not like that you could call them drug dealers, but that might be better than slave sellers. And so when I look at the Founding Fathers one day, I was looking at New England, and I was having the Breakfast of Champions. The Breakfast of Champions, obviously, is a fat bowl of Girl Scout cookies, a cold brew, and a Guinness, because it has protein. <laughs> and I was about to put some sugar in my coffee, and I realized, well, sugar is a fine white powder. Let me say that a little louder. Sugar is a fine white powder. Let me say that a little louder. Sugar is a fine white powder. And just like crack and smack, it's all wrapped up in money and power. See, Coke comes from leaves and opium from flowers. But the granddaddy of the fine white powders is made from beets and cane. People hear the word drugs, they usually think of gangs. They think cold-blooded killers with Latin last names selling PCP, LSD, and Mary Jane and moving meth, ecstasy, and crack cocaine. People hear the word drugs, they think shackles, jails, and chains. They think suffering and pain. They think blood money, backstabbing, and innocent slain, but no such stigma attached to sugar cane. Yeah, there ain't no shame affixed to this fix, so even little kids get lit. They sit and take hits, get ripped off of their pixie sticks, and no one sees a problem with this because this is a fix that we all crave. And we are not ashamed, although we know it was built on the backs of black slaves. So I came here to tell y'all that sugar is a fine white powder, and I want it to ring in your brains a little bit louder. Because its story is the same as what's shot in the veins, a shot up the nose to get straight at the brain. I'm talking blood money, backstabbing, innocent slain. 
I'm talking shackles, jails, and chains. I'm talking suffering and pain, plus headlessness remembered remains, little women and children bagging up the product and counting out the change, and the killers deranged who run the whole game and who teach kids to kill for the material gain. Saddest thing about it is, all of these facts are already in your brain. We sat in little rows, frustrated but so well trained, and we normalized this shit with the phrase, triangle trade. Sugar for rum for slaves. Europeans ruled the waves and got money and power off of little grains of white powder. So I tell y'all that sugar is a fine white powder and none of this history is shrouded in mystery. When the founding fathers authored history, they wrote it as a toast to those that could rip the most from Africa's coast and put them to the yoke on plantations of white powder to fund the guns of white power. The foundation of our nation the Independence Declaration was signed by kingpins who ran drug plantations. So fast forward just a few generations to the days when radio stations will still sing the praises of criminal organizations. And the biggest drug dealers are legally chartered corporations. And on both sides of the law, it's all about location, location, location. It doesn't matter if the battles are fought in courts over end caps instead of blocks or if the people that pack the gats are called cops, it still cash crops to define the line between the haves and the have-nots. And I think we're just too high on sugar to call them crimes when they're committed by the criminal minds on top. So I came here to tell you all that sugar is a fine white powder and I'm asking you, spread the word, because knowledge is power. Thank you.